people just not accepting this idea that sugar could actually be a psychoactive drug that they that they need after they get started after their childhood they just can't put it down and it and it goes on a spectrum then it's like some people i started in late stage food addiction you know folks at 2 and 300 pounds overweight losing limbs going blind and they still couldn't put the sugar down and the, the doctor said you're going to be dead this year if you don't stop they call literally I, i've just drawn these parallels that the keto flu this process that you pass through while you're um coming off the sugar and getting fat adapted is the exact not it is the exact same thing it is sugar addiction withdrawals it is the withdrawals from sugar flour caffeine and these kind of other substances that are having a problem Mike Collins, welcome to the Keto Camp podcast, brother. Thank you, sir. How are you? Good to see you, man. This is uh, I'm excited. This I'm is, excited uh, too. We've uh, grown up together, the two of us, huh? In the, we have. On the online space. Huh? We have. Yeah. The last time we <laughs> had a conversation like this was uh, your summit, uh, which was I think our conversation was like almost two years ago. And you've done yeah, so yeah. much tremendous work. You have a new summit coming up, a Quick Sugar Summit, which we'll talk about. But before we get to that. This is the first time you've actually been on my podcast, so okay. I would imagine some of my audience might not be familiar with your work. Some of them will be, yeah. but your backstory: you have been sugar-free for 32 plus years, which is incredible. You <laughs> also have uh, your your mom was also a, a sugar addict, and um, part right. of that was the reason why she passed away. So I'd love for you to share your story. How did you get involved with what you're doing now, and why did you, why did you decide to go sugar-free 32 plus years ago, Mike? Yeah, no, thanks. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. This is uh, um, the keto community has uh, been a friend of our summits and a friend of uh, our uh, our work. Put it that way. They're very uh, sciency, which I like, you know. But uh, yeah, it started. Uh, I got sober almost 37 years ago now, and you know, pretty much I started at using sugar uh, the same way I was using drugs and alcohol. I wasn't eating any food. Um, and flour and sugar were just the staples of my diet, right? And I'm a thin, athletic guy, and I was gaining weight and acne, and you know the whole thing. It was just like I was tired all the time. So I started delving into. I read a book called Sugar Blues. And Sugar Blues was written by a guy named William Duffy. Duffy was uh, uh, married to Gloria Swanson, the the famous movie star, right? And they promoted that book in the late '70s and early '80s. And uh, I just, it took me a couple of years to get off the stuff. Um, but there was a guy that I was working out in the gym and he was doing no sugar when he was cutting for weight, you know, and uh, no carbs when he was cutting for weight or, you know, cutting for a show. And so we got talking and he was about the only support system I ever had with it. And uh, finally made it off. No flour, no sugar, no caffeine for And and somehow the, the, the story continued where um, uh, I my kids at the time, uh, I, I was married to a woman and I talked her into having children, uh, no flour, no sugar, no caffeine in the womb until they were six years old. Wow. Um, so that was an amazing part of the story. But the, the thing goes a lot farther back, um, as you, uh, you uh, we talked about before we kind of my mom was a. The, my favorite circuit junkie. I mean, she was just covered up with, she just loved this stuff. Um, and the story's kind of sad because when she was eight years old, my grandmother, her mother died and they owned the country store across the way. And my grandfather had to move in with his sister. Um, and she was just lonely and, and Mr. Mom. And so he made a deal with his cousin. He said, Anytime my mom came into that store, she could have any candy she wanted, right? For free, just put it on this tab. And so this literally lasted until the day she died. She genuinely uh, been, he, been thought that um, sugar was love, right? It was, and that's how we were treated as kids. We had unfettered access to the sugar bowl. Um, we could do, you know, we could put as much sugar on our Cheerios and our cornflakes and anything we wanted. And, uh, I mean, we made this gigantic, I mean, I've never seen a bowl as big since. 
uh, of chocolate chip cookies every single Saturday. And it lasted only like three days. But uh, this is how we bonded. I, you know, I would go grocery shopping with her. And because I was the mule, the, the, the carrier, I would get rewarded. And she had a stash and we knew where it was. But anyway, that went on until I was, um, uh, you know, until I literally ran into beer and alcohol and drugs and all that. And that, that party lasted till I was 28. And so when I did get sober, I got, as I mentioned, off the sugar. Um, and it just, I went on to have a regular career, literally a regular life business. And a lot of it was online stuff, but, um, you know, uh, fast forward and I bought sugaraddiction.com in 2009 and started putting out literally the best information on the planet. I mean, it was like, I mean, I, I, the best information I could find sharing sugar blues with them and other videos and stuff. But literally, no one took the information. And I wasn't doing it full time then. Um, it wasn't until about uh, 2017, 18, when I started coaching and more importantly, doing online groups, literal coaching groups. So people could see one another. Zoom was just starting. We were using GoToMeeting and stuff. And so um, it, it was like people could see one another because we're still kind of early adopters as you know um people just not accepting this idea that sugar could actually be a psychoactive drug that they that they need after they get started after their childhood they just can't put it down and it and it goes on a spectrum ben it's like some people i started in late stage food addiction you know folks at two and three hundred pounds overweight losing limbs going blind and they still couldn't put the sugar down. And the doctor said, you're going to be dead this year if you don't stop. And they still couldn't. And to me, that was the definition of addiction. And we've since moved up to what I call harmful users. And these are folks, possibly some of your um, subscribers and listeners, that they want to do everything on a keto diet. Uh, but they just can't put this sugar piece of the puzzle down. They, they just seem to be, they call it, literally, I've, I've just drawn these parallels that the keto flu, this process that you pass through while you're um, coming off the sugar and getting fat adapted is the exact, not it is the exact same thing. It is sugar addiction withdrawals. It is the withdrawals from sugar, flour, caffeine, these kind of other substances that are having a problem. But anyway, that's the short version. That's the podcast version of how I got here from there. And uh, usually it brings up more questions than it answers. But yeah, it's uh, an amazing story. And, and you're right. I think when we hear the word, the term keto flu, it gives keto a bad name, but it's not a keto problem. It's actually carbohydrate sugar withdrawal symptoms. And it's, yeah. it's your way of detoxing that similar exactly. to detoxing a drug. So you mentioned psychoactive drug sugar is a psychoactive drug but you know what right. mike there is drug dealers every <laughs> corner the ice cream truck the walgreens right. the gas station the supermarket yep. so why aren't we recognizing this as a psychoactive drug why is it so readily available in fact people are offended if you're not eating their apple pie or, or whatever it right. is so why is this happening why why haven't we caught up yet no, it's, it's a fair question, and it's a good question. <clears throat> you and I, I think, um, are looking at it a little myopically, and I've kind of come to this conclusion personally, is that there, because I'm immersed in it and because we do these summits we'll talk about later, where I've interviewed over 250 of the world's leading scientists who to date have been languishing in anonymity, not being able to get their story and information about, they've been studying it for years, decades, some of them. And, but 95% of the population just doesn't get this yet. They haven't really adopted or adapted this uh, idea. And to be honest and to be fair, they are not, up to date on the science, the actual science that has exploded in the last five years about the brain, the body, the glucose, the fructose, everything that around uh, sugar and its potential and power as a psychoactive and powerful neurotoxin, 
right? A body, uh, a toxin in the body. And it's like the tech world, Ben. It's like everything. It's like there's early adopters and then there's, you know, uh, lag, people that come in later and then, then the population gets it. You and I have lived through this twice in our life, which is drinking and driving and smoking and smoking in public places, smoking in general, but smoking in public places where at first it was like, you know, whatever. It was just not accepted very well. And only a few people were passionate about it. And then finally on the other side, which we like we've lived through and watched is we've been able to see that, you know, back in my day, if you were drinking and driving, it was just, they would pat you on the head and say, just don't get caught. And now you are definitely a, uh, you know, an outcast if you're, you know, drinking and driving and then cigarettes the same way. Right. And cigarettes is a better parallel because of the, um, the health component, right? Well, not that drinking and driving is a, is a healthy activity, but, you know, the health component of people are wising up. And I think, to be honest, to, to be fair, the, the tobacco litigation, which was literally a trillion dollar, five to seven year um, free advertising campaign, drove the American population to from 40 plus percent of the American adult population smoking down below 14%. And it was because of that exposure. And what you're doing and what I'm doing, I think is a parallel. I think there's gonna be a tipping point where people are aware of this. And I think the important part is going to be the research around the brain and giving this product to children both in the womb and as they're young and the developmental, the brain development stuff, let alone the body stuff um, that children, because mothers will do anything for their kids mm -hmm. and they're not going to maybe quit just to lose a couple pounds, but they're going to, that, you know, it's going to be a change. So it's long answer to a sh short question, but yeah. Yeah. And it's important that you said it's not just when the, the, the mom gives birth, it's actually when the baby's in the womb. So if right. you're pregnant and listening to this, it's, it's right now. Yeah. There is a parallel as, as well with uh, the tobacco smoking industry and sugar in regards to back, I, I forget the years, but back in the day, doctors, when smoking was socially right. acceptable, exactly. just like sugar, doctors would be promoting their favorite tobacco brand and they would be yes. you know endorsing smoking cigarettes. And of course that's changed, but now we see that with doctors promoting sugar, as long as you're, you know, meeting your calorie intake and you can yeah. have the sugar. And, and there's even some people in our space. And uh, I mean, the health and fitness space that say sugar addiction is actually not real. It's a made up thing. Yeah. So what right. would you say to those who are saying that sugar addiction is a, is a fake thing that we're making up here? That they should just spend five minutes in my inbox or five minutes in my instant messenger and they would see the pain out there the pain that the, as I mentioned, the losing limbs, the going blind yeah. and they still can't quit. And moreover, I think, which I think is the answer, your, the work you're doing and I'm doing is the stories of success. And th if they were to understand it and hear it, that the struggles, decades long struggles of people who have tried to quit sugar Look, you've recognized it, you know, 95% of every diet ever written, literally every diet ever written, it's probably higher than 95%, says quit the white stuff, flour and sugar, or cut back on it, right? And the problem is, and, and people have cycled through all these things, but the problem is, is that they, and this is a bigger problem in the eating disorder world, right? So you look at binge eating and the quote unquote cure for binge eating is moderation of source. They don't, you're not well in the eating disorder world if you can't moderate um, some amount of sugar and flour. But the simple fact of the matter is, and the science is proving this out day in and day out, um, that some people biochemically cannot ingest sugar. And the success stories of people who have tried to moderate over the years and to just do a diet or a detox or something like that, and then eventually end up going back. You know the literature, 
95% of all people that lose any amount of weight gain it all back and then some in the first year. And if they could see what happens in our communities where people disappear for a time and then that fact comes true, they gain it back, they begin to realize that and it really is an acceptance thing. It's an acceptance, a level of acceptance of the word and the terminology addiction, because it is still stigmatized, regardless of its drugs, alcohol, even tobacco now. But when you think about sugar, they're like, I'm, they're not willing to accept the idea that they are an addict. And I'd love to find softer words. Um, you know, I'd love to find easier words or easier constructs. But the reality is, this is one that people know. And they're, they realize that after they get 60, 90, 120 days, no sugar, they realize that for 20 years, they tried to do it their way and moderate. And that moderate or, or abstinence, 100% abstinence, ended up being a whole lot easier than trying to moderate. And so once you see all of the the components of this immersion that I've had for a decade and then, you know, full time for three or four years here, five years almost, um, they would see that the answer is not uh, any kind of moderation and that sugar addiction is very, very real. When you say 100% abs abstinence, are you also including into that like fruit, for example, or, or are there some <laughs> exceptions to the rule with fruit with some people? I get a lot of pushback on the fruit, Ben. Okay, I, I do. And, and I, I understand it. You know, back in the day, some marketing term a group uh, married fruits and vegetables. Yeah. And fruits and vegetables are not the same. Okay. Fruits have been hybridized for what? For fructose, the, you know, the lead, one of the leads on our summit is a man with a book coming out. I could get it. It's over there somewhere. They Richard, send it to was it, What's his name? Richard Johnson. Yeah. yeah I just interviewed him. I just, okay, there I'm, you go. I'm releasing it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the fructose part of this component is so powerful and these products are hybridized for what? For fructose. Mm -hmm. Now there is a, you know, like coca leaves and cocaine, powdered and processed fructose, which is for your audience, 50% of the table sugar molecule, half glucose, half fructose. Yes, the um, powdered stuff, the, fr the, the processed stuff is more powerful, but when you're talking about seedless grapes and um, seedless oranges and hybridized apples, and these things are super high in fructose, and we found through a decade of trial and error that people who binge on the sugar, the flower, or excuse me, the fruit during their detox have they they set the they keep the cravings alive. Yeah. They keep the fructose, uh, as Dr. Johnson I'm sure has said, they keep the fructose. It keeps the fructose um, pathways alive, and so. During detox, during the first 30, 60, 90 days, we try and go low uh, fructose and low glycemic stuff, which is berries and what have you. And some people can go back to eating moderate amounts of fruit. You know, some of the famous carnivores are now eating some fruit and what have you. But yeah. if you're trying to get off sugar, you need to include this. You need to think about it in a way that it's it's about the fructose. It's not about... Um, the powder stuff is you have to think about, we know what the glucose does to the body, the diabetes too, the weight, the, and every other malady you can think of Alzheimer's they're calling diabetes three, right? But what is little known and, and I'm so excited to have Dr. Johnson on our summit is that people don't realize what the fructose is doing. What kicked this off a decade ago was Robert Lustig's YouTube video that went strangely viral. Yeah. Is a college lecture of 90 minutes describing what? Fructose, yeah. right? And so I had an email go out today and, and I was gonna I was gonna say, like they said in the Clinton administration, it's the fructose, stupid. And I didn't want to offend anyone, and that's not politically correct anymore. <laughs> but it's not the sugar, quote unquote, it's the fructose.
Yeah, well said. You know, so during that time frame where you're detoxing the sugar, 30, 60, 90 days, good idea to avoid all of that. Yeah. What about stevia and monk fruit? Would you also avoid that during that time frame? It's so interesting. Um, I had a conversation with Gabriel Cousin, who's probably the most famous vegan, veget raw food vegan vegetarian in the world. He basically has a raw food keto vegan diet. App or uh, avocados and uh, greens and uh, olives, right? And and fat, does he throw in fasting as well to get? And, into and he's a faster. He leads okay. fasting retreats, and he believes you should start with five days of fasting. I don't personally believe that, but that's another yeah. story. <laughs> but I, my hero man, used to be uh, uh, Jack Lane, who pulled seventy people in seventy boats with his hands tied, hands and feet, dolphin kicking for on his seventieth birthday. Dr. Cousins can do 1,800 push-ups in a row at 79, right? And the reason I bring Dr. Cousins in is because he's tested all of these things and, and doesn't think any of them can, should be used except stevia, which was oh, weird. Interesting. Now, personally, I don't believe you use stevia either. I don't believe any of those products. What you have to do is you have to... Um, move away from your taste buds your taste buds change like every seven to ten days so ten you know very quickly peppers are going to taste sweet onions are going to taste sweet carrots are going to taste sweet macadamia nuts will taste like candy you've got to move away another guy we had on um uh, what's his name from the cantley lab lewis cantley at, at uh at cornell he said that and i agree with this and i've seen this in practice thousands of times is that when people get the sweet taste, their body is needing and thinking about the real thing and it leads them to it. It just keeps, like the fructose, keeps the cravings alive. And you can't have that. It just, everyone that is listening to this is tried keto. So everyone who has done this has tried to get off flour and sugar and they can attest to these cravings, right? These are the things that stop your progress. And if you can get past 30, 60, or 90 days, the physical cravings go away. But the mental cravings will remain if you insist on using all of these artificial sweeteners because your brain is still engaged in this sweet hunt, this sweet. And Dr. Le or Dr. Um, Johnson's book and, and, and his new study about the foraging thing is that the body goes into overdrive, continuing to look for more sweetness when it first ingests. Remember, as I'm sure he told you, we only got fructose once a year at a short period of time when the fruit was ripe or when they would uh, try and get some honey. And the rest of the year, we just didn't have the product. And so the brain was adapted to search the product out because it has a, it has a function in animals and humans, early animals and humans, not the diet we see today. That's so, right. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's such an interesting anthropological puzzle. People say, Mike, you should be a doctor. Are you a doctor? I said, no, I'm not nowhere near a doctor. But if I were a doctor, it would be a doctorate in anthro anthropological human um, diet, right? the study of how we got into this problem. And if people did study the history, they would understand the stuff that we're talking about here. Yeah, you know, you make a good point. Speaking of which, when Dr. Richard Johnson was on my show, he was talking about his book called Nature Wants Us to Be Fat. He was referencing how animals, bears, for example, would eat all this fruit, all this fructose to put on yeah. as much fat as possible before they went to hibernation. And that's an example of what fructose is doing to us. It's making us fat. And, and, and when you look back at history, that's the way that it, it went. Second point that you made was really interesting is I remember when I first did keto in 2013, 2014, I was super strict with keto. I was not having stevia or monk fruit or anything like that. And about three or four months into this strict process, I remember being at Starbucks and I got this dark chocolate at Starbucks and I ate a piece of it and it tasted so sweet to me. It tasted like <laughs> right. milk chocolate. And I'm like, I have never tasted dark chocolate. It tasted like milk chocolate. Yeah. And I reset my, my taste buds and that was sweet to me. And then the carrots were sweet to me and the macadamia yeah. nuts were sweet to me. So it's a matter of resetting that palate. 
which yes. takes some time, but it but it can be done. Yeah. I do I do want to get into what sugar does to the brain uh, mm. specifically because you mentioned that it is mm. a psychoactive drug and yeah. it influences the brain. So what exactly is happening in the brain when we're eating fructose and sugar and uh, high processed carbohydrate foods? Yeah, I think this part of the puzzle, when people get it and accept it, they change and their life changes. They, they really do. And all of the brain reward chemicals are affected by sugar, uh, dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, GABA, your adrenal glands, your endorphins, even the big one, oxytocin, the bonding chemical. All of these are affected and depleted. And the more than depleted, they are manually manipulated by sugar right? You, when you're, you know, when you do finally stop, you're, you're, you're starting the game with less dopamine receptors. They've been downregulated. They've been thinned out, right? And this is, this is something I intuitively knew many years ago. And now the scientists are really catching up with, this, especially Dr. Johnson and the fructose research. Right? Is leptin as well part of that? Is leptin receptor? Yes, all of these things. And Dr. Cousins was talking about the leptin. All of these things are affected. All of the hormonal pathways in your body, the ghrelin, the leptin, everything is affected, right? And by this neurotoxin. And one of the things that people, the, a mental shift that if people were able to grasp, they would, um, they have to realize that since the womb, 95%, 98% of the time that passes the, uh, well, it passes the blood brain barrier the whole time, but 95% of people were like a, cr a crack cocaine baby. They, they became a, a sugar baby, right? And not the sugar baby people are thinking about. Yeah. They're thinking about like, it's the, um, and then they, they, they continued it as a baby and, and as an adult. And they're not thinking their cravings are for a sweet taste, although their body has co-opted their entire system, like their stomach and their taste buds and their, their brain and everything. They're trying to get a dopamine hit. They're trying to get back to normal, right? Because when you get to be an adult, the only thing you're really doing is fighting off withdrawals. You're fighting off the, the lowered dep dopamine the man manual unconscious manipulation that you've done because you can get this product anywhere. It's almost free and you never have to worry about it. So people ingrained this into their life, thinking and believing that the possibility that, that, that when they craved something, that they were craving something sweet when in reality, they were just craving to get their dopamine level back up a little bit, right? And when they grasp that simple concept, their life changes because now they realize that it's just not this ubiquitous uh, common substance that, that they can just reach and grab uh, anywhere in any household. I mean, the stories are unbelievable. Kids eating sugar cubes, eating sugar right out of the bag, you know, that their cravings for it were real and that this societal acceptance, you can give this product to a one-year-old with no legal, moral, or, you know, ethical worries. And so they not thinking that the possibility exists that they are trying to elevate their dopamine and all the other things I mentioned, serotonin, norepinephrine, GABA, that they're playing with manually manipulating like they were drinking or doing drugs. They just want to get back to normal. And because the buzz, quote unquote, the, the, the rapidity or the level of the high or the level of the, that, that, all is right with the world feeling for about 20 minutes. And then you're chasing the high again, right? Yeah. And it's like that first cigarette and cup of coffee in the morning, right? It's like you're feeling, and then you can't wake up and not do it. You just have to have that, even if it's just that respite of 30 or 20 or 30 minutes, and then you're chasing it all day long. And people that don't drink and people that don't smoke and people that don't do cough caffeine, they're they think they're better than right because they're doing it with sugar yeah. and the first it couldn't be the physical sorry the physical um maladies don't manifest for 20 or 30 years the weight the diabetes 
the heart disease, all of these things don't manifest for a long time. Yeah, that's that's that, the, that's the challenge. You don't see the immediate negative right. consequence of that decision. Yeah, I mean, you're not going to crash a car, probably. You know, you're not going to get arrested for stealing because you need to support your habit. It's too inexpensive. And, and the buzz is not the euphoria of the other substances, but it is so... I actually think it's a perfect drug. It's it's such a a subtle wellness feeling that comes over you for a few minutes that you because you're only fighting off withdrawals, you're not really catching on to it, right? You're just thinking you're leading leading your life, right? And this part has to this is part of it. But when you consciously separate these things, and when, like, if I told you to stop eating steak for a month, you'd say, okay, yeah, no problem. I mean, you like steak, you'd, you'd substitute, right? But when you stop eating sugar, these symptoms come on, these with this, this inability, this free rent in your head where people all of a sudden, they're like, I, 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 got, I got to have it, you know? It's like they're trying to do a keto diet, but they can't put this, how, I mean, I don't know about you, but. I'll tell you a story, a guy lost a hundred pounds on keto, right? Plateaued, right? He couldn't get off the peanut M&Ms. <laughs> it was like, he just for two years kept being, he had 60 more pounds to lose. And he just kept being drawn back to it, right? And he was really good about his keto diet. There were no exceptions in his keto diet, but peanut M&Ms <laughs> once, and here's what happened. He had had a relationship with a woman for 12 years and it was, how do I say, uh, <laughs> chaotic at the, at the least. And he realized that every time he was ingesting peanut M&Ms, he had had a dust up or something with that woman. Mm. Now, years later, the woman is gone, the peanut M&Ms are gone and the 60 pounds are gone because he finally realized that he was just relieving himself of the anxiety of the situation. And he was using an, a ubiquitous free almost drug uh, to, and again, he had lost a hundred pounds already. And when he came to me, he just couldn't understand why his brain couldn't compute this peanut M&M &M equation. You know? That's a power tip right there, because if somebody listening or watching has a sugar addiction, which chances are it's a high percentage. Yeah. If you could pinpoint, the events that are frequently occurring in your life, the high anxiety, high stressful events that are happening in your day to day, it could be a relationship, a job, some sort of activity that you find yourself stressed and then walking to the kitchen, walking to the pantry and eating the sugar. If you could remove the stressful event, you could potentially remove that habit of eating the sugar. Is that what you're saying, Mike? That's a hundred percent exactly what I'm saying. And you know, there's a very, this is amazing, actually, that people don't know this. Hell, people don't know it in the substance use disorder world, let alone in our world. It is a very well-known construct in the substance use disorder world that if you started using um, alcohol or drugs at 14 or 15, you stopped growing emotionally. Your life is a mess. Your relationships are a mess. Your finances are a mess. Your career is a mess, right? You're in treatment, you know, and people realized that they had stopped. Like what would happen is that they would live their life. A problem would come up. They would use, they'd be okay for that night. But the next day, the problem's still there. Nothing changed. They didn't get a better job. They didn't get, the, they didn't become responsible. Their life was interrupted emotionally. The maturity of their emotions had been stunted, right? Now, this is like any treatment center, any recovery book, you'll read this. But think about going back to the womb. Think about going back to childhood where we are using this product, right? And now that the brain science, the Lustigs and the Tobbs and the Johnsons and the Cantleys have proven that this is affecting the brain, that the affecting the emotions, affecting everything to do with your 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 your, your nucleus accumbens, your processing. The sugar is actually drawing the the 
um, blood system back to the primitive brain, which is making you feel better emotionally but by the dopamine and serotonin by activating it manually and pulling it away from the frontal cortex which is why an intelligent man can can like lose a hundred pounds on a beautiful system that is working but still can't put down this one product that's why it's happening metabolically physically uh in their brain in their biology in their in their system that's why it's happening and now this is coming out and becoming more well known um people are accepting this um paradigm this this shift that has to occur in society and individually for people to get well and to get off the sugar that's quite honestly killing them that's fascinating. So the blood flow is going from the prefrontal cortex, which is where you are critically thinking and making your decisions. Yes. And it's being shuttled to your the primitive part of your brain, which is for survival. When you are mm -hmm. going through stress, uh, anxiety, and this fight or flight, fight or yeah. flight. Yeah, it's it it's it and it's that's where it's that's where it's giving the relief of the stressful situation. That's where mm -hmm. we got. Um, let's just call it what it is we got addicted to it because when we ingested it we got a calm about us a serenity about us a peace about us that everything is all right in the world about us right this feeling came over us and we didn't put it together consciously that it was coming from something we ingested because it is so freely available and so when the you know when the construct when the um the process begins to cleave apart to separate what i call a drug a psychoactive drug with a real food we finally start to see the 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 cracks and the the i don't want to say rationale but just the acceptance of what you've done all you, your life you know the old saying you know doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. If you've done diets over and over again, and you've done um, keto or whatever it is over and over again, but you kept getting drawn back to the sugar and plateauing and the flour, maybe if you try it this way, I always, I always say buy into Mikey's little fantasy. <laughs> Just give me 90 days. Never been, never. That, well, no, they slip occasionally but they never go back once they get 90 full days of 100% abstinence from flour and sugar. And we like to include caffeine because caffeine and sugar are paired together with almost everything and chocolate and tea and coffee. And when you ingest, ca now about 10% of people, and it pisses me off a little, and I don't know if this is you, I won't, I, I'll apologize afterwards, but this drinking caffeine and doing keto is ends badly, okay? 10% of people can do it early on, but it just keeps this dopamine, this playing with your brain alive, okay? So when you and say it ends badly, you mean specifically for a sugar addict? For a sugar addict and a caffeine addict, yes. A caffeine addict, okay. Caf this is the craziest thing I've ever heard, man. Look, caffeinism, caffeine use disorder is actually in the DSM. Because doctors, the medical establishment has has seen it with their eyes, what happens when people abuse this drug, right? Somehow, we still have to fight to get what I'm calling you know, sugar use disorder or processed food use disorder into the DSM, right? We, we can't get it in there so that people can get insurance and get you know doctor visits and rehab. And it'll happen. It's going to happen. The science is catching up. But this caffeine thing that I see some of the biggest of the big with their proclamations of ca caffeine and coffee, it's starting to piss me off, to be honest with you, because it's harming their folks, right? And they're substituting their sugar and their flour for their heightened black coffee and black tea habits. And that's going to end badly for the pancreas, for the brain, for anxiety, you know, there's just too many parts to that. And again, I'm the sugar guy, but in my work, this is a true story, okay? 
So I don't know how much time we got, but this, this we're good. Keep going. <laughs> I worked with an Olympic athlete. She placed in the Olympics and I'll get her name. She said it was okay to mention her name. She got a bronze medal She's from Australia and she, we were trying to get her off sugar and she like couldn't get off sugar and I couldn't understand it. And she could do anything with her body, obviously. Right. And, but she just kept going back to the sugar. So we went and did an audit, or this is about four or five years ago, went back and did an audit of her thing. And her coaches had her start on coffee at 10 years old, okay? 10 years old. Now, not Coca-Cola, coffee. And any 10-year-old is drinking coffee, had to have sugar with it, right? Mm -hmm. So there was this, like the stevia, like the sugar, this fake sugars, this reaction in her brain that as she tried to drink, you know, continue her life with this black coffee, that the sugar cravings were kept alive, right? Because of this manual manipulation of the dopamine and the serotonin, right? And everything else. And so when she got off the coffee, she was able to get off the sugar and stay off it. So, and it was hard because it's deep. And we have a small caffeine group on Facebook and the withdrawals, model amphetamine withdrawals very closely, right? And they take a long time, longer than sugar, to heal the brain up, to heal these other functions of the brain up. And so it's just, again, I'm not calling out the guys, but I, I really wish they would stop talking about the coffee stuff that I got to have my coffee and I'm keto as hell. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, no. you make a fair point. No need yeah. to apologize. Yeah. Uh, so for those who are, because this episode's coming out in, in January, right? And January is the year or the new year where a lot of people are making changes. And a lot of these people are probably starting keto. They're probably one week, two weeks into keto as they listen to this. I think one of the best tips that we can give is what you already mentioned, which is to identify the high anxiety moments that are happening in your day to day that are leading to you going to your pantry and having the sugar. So identify that and work on removing that. Yeah. But besides that tip, Mike, what are some, maybe a couple of other tips for those making this transition for them to stick with this for 30 to 60 to 90 days? Of course, you have your summit coming up, which is called the Quit Sugar Summit 2022 edition. And that's yeah. going to be a masterclass. And we'll share a little bit more about that soon. But what are some practical tips that you could share with my audience as they make this transition right now to keto? Yeah, probably the best uh, question of the day. You know, I like to talk about the macro and the society and the in in the whole thing and the you know the the space and and I'm trying to you know raise awareness. But the most important person is the person just starting and the person trying to do this. Uh, and I have to be honest with the people. And this is a true story. So I own SugarAddiction.com, obviously, but. I literally had to buy sugardetox.com because people don't want to hear about the addiction piece. I literally have to trick them into um, getting the in, getting inside so they can see what's going on, right? And then they make that they self-sort for whether or not they're an addict, right? And so here's the thing. I'm going to tell your folks because, you know, we're friends and people are struggling, whatever. This is going to be hard for about seven to 10 days. You're going to feel like crap. And if you do caffeine, flour, sugar, and caffeine at the same in the third to fifth to seventh day, you are going to be incapacitated. If you had any habit at all, you're going to be lethargic. You're going to be depressed, physically depressed. Not You don't have a mental problem most times. Now, check with your doctor. But, you know, most because your dopamine finally says, thank you, God, you're giving me a rest. And to physically heal that takes time, right? You're going to be starving to death. It's because your body's trying, is craving to get these carbohydrates and these sugar back in. You're going to be um, uh, sleeping a lot, right? You're going to be, you're, you're not going to want to do anything. But I promise you, I promise you that if you can get through that with good rest, good hydration, good exercise, um, you know, do, you know, take like a, a at home spa week or so. Um, and get through that seven to 10. And sometimes if you're way overweight and you've got a huge habit, um, 
it, it, this could last as long as 20 days or 30 days, but it will pass and you will get to the other side and all of these things will go away, but you've got to, um, you have to understand that they're coming, right? You have to understand that this is going to happen to you and that unconsciously your lower brain, your reptilian brain is trying to fight to get that back in to relieve all those symptoms. And anybody who's ever done it knows that one cup of coffee with a big bunch of sugar in it will relieve it all and you'll be back to normal. And what happens is people go into this process with kids and jobs and they get to the fourth day and they say, I ain't got time for this. Yeah. I got kids to raise. I got a job to do. I cannot continue this, right? And so uh, know it's coming and get with a group of people, Ben's group, my group. There's a hundred groups now online of people who are doing the same thing. You have to have this that support because currently we're still early adopters. We're still the odd man out. You quit smoking cigarettes. All right, quit drinking. Wow, that's great. Congratulations. You quit using sugar, flour, caffeine. You go keto. And they're like, what? what? That's weird. That's weird, What's dude. That's <laughs> weird. You're uh, no, you're gonna die. You can't. You got to have carbs. Yeah, you know. And what's happening is they're like looking at themselves in your mirror, the mirror of your face. They're saying to themselves. Wow. I mean, if she's doing it, maybe I need to do it. You know what I mean? That's and right. so they're trying to say, but I baked this for you, but I bought this for you. And they're trying to keep you in a tribe that evolved over three or 400 years. That is not, you know, if you left, we're tribe animals. And if you left the tribe before you literally died, you, you the, the, the pull is so strong to stay in a tribe even a dysfunctional tribe that you can't and don't want to leave it. And they honestly, to be honest, the people that are trying to pull you back, they think you might be injured if you go too far astray of the tribe. Right. And so they don't want you to go away deep in their, their limbic brain. They want you to stay involved in the tribe. And so you have to have a new tribe. You got one when you went to college. You got one when you went to law school. You got one when you got in athletics. You got different tribes in your life. You don't have to leave your family. You don't have to leave your friends. You have to be involved with another tribe who believes, as you and I do, that these products might not be good for you, and the science is catching up with that. So that's another piece of the puzzle, and it's probably one of the bigger pieces of the puzzle. And then you have to conquer if you will, walk through these social pieces where you will be the odd person out. In Restaurants, weddings, yes, parties, correct. yeah, barbecues. Correct. It's 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 difficult sometimes. And it's it's not fun at the beginning. But after a while, I swear to you, and after I have a thousand thousands literally of verified rent written testimonials, the people will start to stick up for you. Your kids, your spouse, they'll hand you a cookie or something. No, no, my mom does not eat cookies. Yeah. It, the whole thing flips because they'll see you lose the weight. They'll see you get up early. They'll see you processing better. They'll see you focusing better. They'll see you not irritable. I think you've had Joan Iflin on. Yes. Joan is the most honest person about what a bitch she was to her <laughs> children. And this irritability went away. Mm -hmm. When I first met Joan 11 years ago, she was, had an edge to her <laughs> and she laughs. I brought it up at this summit. I, I finally broached it. I said, she was a little, you know, and now she's the most kindest, quiet, you know, I mean, she's just like a, a personality transfer because she was in sugar withdrawals most of the time. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So, I love that. That's such a great Great share. It's so valuable. This conversation is so valuable to so many people going through this. And you have to do it long enough to see those results for the for the family to start supporting you and the friends to start supporting you. But in the beginning, expect that that's not going to happen. You know, when you make changes, the truth of the matter is that when you change, you become a threat to everybody in your life who's not changing. And it's that limbic right. system, that tribe-like 
environment, when you're leaving the tribe with your decisions, you know, not necessarily technically leaving, but your decisions are different than your tribe, it sets that off. And it's easier for them to take you back to what they're doing and their bad, ha bad habits than for them to change their habits. Yes. So I remember when I was going through my 80 pound weight loss transformation, sugar addicted, drug addicted, not so much alcohol addicted, but video game addicted. I would go to barbecues and I knew that I needed to get over this 80 pounds of obesity, depression, suicide, sugar addiction. So I'd say, no, I can't have that beer. No, I'm not going to eat those chips. Like, just give me the steak. Just give me the chicken. And my friends would make fun of me. They would call me, you know, a wuss. And what are you doing? You know, one <laughs> beer is not going to hurt you. And these comments right. could right. hold a lot of weight. But if you're so convicted in what you want to accomplish, they will rub off of you like water off of a fish. So the yeah. formula that I, that I always share with my community, the formula that I believe for success in all areas, not just this conversation of sugar addiction, is suck, 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 cess, right? In, <laughs> embrace like the suck. Just keep moving forward. Embrace right. it. And on the opposite side is a successful life. But you have to do it long enough to achieve that. Yeah. So you mentioned the tribe. We just talked about how important it is to find a new tribe. The best opportunity right now for the keto campers listening and watching is this upcoming sugar addiction uh, summit, which is Quit Sugar Summit 2022. Yeah. I have been blessed to be a speaker twice before, and I'm coming back for this uh, new upcoming event. <laughs> Grateful to do that. So share a little bit more about the event. What are some of the speakers and what would the listener viewer expect to accomplish after going through this? Yeah, no, thanks. I appreciate it. And it's always a pleasure to have you on and, and to speak with you on it. And um, it, it's interesting. Some of the we call the you like you the friends of the summit. They they their um, message gets clear each time, right? Uh, their their uh, understanding of the problem because they're keeping an eye on the science and they're having success with their folks. So it's always a pleasure. But the, the Quit Sugar Sum is we're in our eighth year, and this is a, the eighth annual January uh, event. We, we, you know, we've tried to take over January. You know, we want, this is when people are doing their thing, right? And uh, we have all of the best scientists, right? Uh, I mean, we just this year, I'll, I'll, I got to look real quick because there's so many. But Yeah, um, understood. Uh, you know, lead, led with you know, David Perlmutter, <clears throat> Brain Grain, and all these, you know, we, we've themed this summit the uh, sugar in your brain, okay? And Dr. Perlmutter's got a book coming out. Uh, Richard Johnson, who we spoke about, amazing fructose research, just amazing. And he's gonna tell me some stuff that he couldn't tell me last year, um, uh, patented stuff, okay? Uh, Dr. Nicole Lavina, uh, you know, Yale graduate, uh, Princeton graduate, excuse me, um, you know, research neuroscientist, just amazing. Wrote a lot about kids and diet, right? Yeah. She's got a big uh, TEDx, a TEDx talk on YouTube as well. Yeah, TEDx, yep. Doctor Tim Noakes, um, uh, 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 like he literally wrote the book and helped the South Africans take over the world of running, and it was all about carb loading, right? And he got diabetes at sixty, had to change his whole life, and realized the mistake that he made. And wrote another book called The Lore of Nutrition. Okay. Uh, he's from South Africa and he's on uh, Dr. Michael Gorin, the Gorin Lab at USC, named after the guy. Okay. And he's raised $50 million for obesity and childhood obesity. No one's ever heard of the guy, right? Mm -hmm. Just wrote a book recently called Sugar Proof for Kids. Mm -hmm. uh, amazing guy. Uh, ben, who's this guy? Ben Azadi's on. <laughs> um, uh, we just landed a couple of late folks, uh, Dr. Chris uh, Palmer from Harvard, uh, who's doing a lot of work with uh, 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 brain illnesses, epilepsy mostly in the keto diet. Uh, who else? Uh, Craig Emmerich, everybody knows Craig, you know, Maria, uh, Dr. Cousins. Look, we're not, you know, Dr. Cousins essentially is a vegan keto guy. I mean, it's like he's probably the most famous vegetarian in the world, I'm guessing. Um, it just goes on. I mean, there's just, you know, sugar addiction experts, Vera Tarman and Joan Iflin and, um, uh, Bitten Johnson. It just, it, it just goes on and on. There's, you know, probably going to be over 40 speakers this time, but, um, it's just Amazing. an exciting time. One of the things that happens when I look back at what we've done is people got their exposure to 
uh, the sugar world from this event because it wasn't me telling them. It wasn't you telling them. You know, they're thinking, oh, we're, that guy's selling something or whatever, you know. It's all these scientists with all these degrees who have just been studying this stuff forever, right? And, and they're not selling anything. I mean, they may have a book, but they're not selling anything. You know what I yeah. mean? They're just communicating information. And so, uh, because they, the problem out there, Ben, I believe is that people have been duped by diets forever. You know, diet culture has, per, the diet industry is a $70 billion industry and no one believes it still. They still use it. They still try it. They still do it, but they don't believe it anymore. And so they put sugar, abstinence, keto, they put this in that category right? What the summit does is it eliminates that by bringing scientists who are selling nothing, who have been researching, like I said, for decades in anonymity and puts them in the people's face. Yeah. Kind of hard to ignore at that point. Yeah. And the summit begins on January 24th. Is it seven days? Is that seven how days straight, completely free. You completely don't have to free. pay in. Go and, click on Ben's link and go to the, the, you know, and just give us your name and we'll tell you who speaks every day. So you don't miss anything. So yeah. We're going to put the link in the notes of, if you're watching on YouTube, it's right at the top. If you're on the podcast, it's still at the top. Just click it. You just put your name and email and you'll get signed up for it. It's seven days. You could always upgrade your membership, I believe, to get some bonuses and lifetime yeah. recordings. I, I would personally do that because I'm that, that type of person who likes to go back and rewatch it, but it's free. And it's going to change your life. Dedicate those seven days to watch the speakers, take notes, and then most importantly, take action on what you're going to learn. I mean, the lineup of speakers you just shared, and there's right. more. Yeah, there's more. Exceptional. And if yeah. you could, I always love summits like this, Mike, because if you think about it, if you combine all of the speakers that you're having at this summit and the years of research, the amount of money they spend on their credentials, the viewer now, which is somebody who signs up for free, yeah. gets all of their research, all of their years <laughs> of experience and money spent on credentials. And they take decades of learning and all this money and they take decades and turn that into seven days yeah. of synthesizing that great information. So it's such a special opportunity and it's super cool. You're on your eighth year. I mean, how incredible is that? I'm sure you're going to keep going strong. And yeah, it's a, I mean, it, like it said, like you said, it's totally free too. You don't have to pay for it. The reason people would pay for it is because five or six hours a day, uh, it's a full-time job <laughs> yeah. and you know, the, the, the package is cheap compared to that. And all the speakers give you some little bonus with it. So it's yeah. just, you can watch it. You can, what we call time shift. You know, you can, if you're off in the night or whatever, or you want to do it a week later, you can do it a week later. A lot of people just watch one a day for, a, for 90 days and it helps them with their sugar and helps them with their keto. You know what I mean? It helps them with their process. So, but if you want take the week off and you can watch it for free for the whole seven days. Yeah. And you know, it's worth it. If you take the week off from work and you take care of this addiction, you're going to be so much more productive, uh, productive and happier and healthier. And it's, it's, it's so worth it. Your health is your wealth. And this is a great opportunity to really overcome the sugar addiction, the food addiction once and for all. Yeah. You mentioned or something earlier about, well, you have a book by the way, which is called the last sugar detox guide, which we'll also put a link for down below. It's on Amazon, but yeah. you mentioned that you bought the website. Um, what were the two websites that you have? Well, sugaraddiction.com was the original website, and then I bought sugardetox.com just right. just so that people can, um, uh, you know, detoxes have become all the rage. When I first started ten years ago, there were none. Now there's hundreds right. of them. colon cleanses, liver cleanses, the whole aisle in Whole Foods. Yeah, and and what the, and and with the sugar thing is that there's a ninety plus percent of them doing people a disservice because. There's, I counted them. I've, I've, I've tried to get this done, like George Carlin's thing. Three day, seven day, 10 day, 14 day, 21 day, 28 day. And I've even heard 15 and one. I mean, there, the problem with those detoxes, gang, uh, if you're listening and paying attention this late in the podcast, is that they get you all excited and then leave you in no man's land. Like they, the research that about the, regaining the weight it's like you can't just detox 
and then go back. It, it's probably more dangerous, I'm guessing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we, we it, there there is a method to this madness that we do um, that has thousands of success stories because we are in it for the long haul. We're in it with you for the long haul. We got we got Zoom meetings every day of the week. You know, ten fifteen thousand people in Facebook group in a, in a forums. I mean, it's this is real for you know a support system for you, you know. Yeah. And, and the reason I, I brought that up again, the websites is because it's, it's funny because you say sugaraddiction.com, but people don't really like resonate with that word addiction, even though it is an right. addiction. Yeah. So you, then you bought sugardetox.com, which gets them in and then they could identify themselves as an, as an addict. Right. For me, After, it's, it, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say it's very, it's, it's somewhat similar when I teach keto. Yeah. A lot of people will want to come to keto to lose weight so yeah i'll use those words you know losing weight yes but then i'll bring them in and i'll reframe them and I'll, I'll let them know you don't lose weight to get healthy you get healthy to lose weight and then i teach them how to get healthy right because that's a buzzword detox is a buzzword losing weight is a buzzword but truly we want to overcome an addiction and we want to get healthy not detox necessarily the way they teach it and also not lose weight it's it's the opposite way so it's very similar the way we thought about this mike no it, it, you know you know what you're saying is exactly what everyone is saying on the summit and this is what i've seen in the evolution of the storytelling right what we need to help people right and what happens is when they're you know uh when people first come to me is exactly the same it's to lose weight right and we got a saying, come for the vanity, stay for the sanity, right? And it's like, <laughs> but when we do the exit surveys, when people are 30, 60, 90 days out, right? Weight loss and even putting type 2 diabetes in remission or, or arthritis or something in remission is like numbers three and four and five. You know what's number one? Their brain, mm. their processing power, their uh, focus, their memory their ability to work longer, their ability to get up earlier and sleep, not sleep as much. It's the brain benefits that they love the most. And so once people get to understanding this and yeah, they're coming to lose weight, to look better and whatever, but once they actually live it in practice, there's another benefit that's better. And this whole summit is about the brain. So Amazing. I love that. Come for the vanity, stay for the sanity. That's great. Yeah, yeah. What uh, What are the names of your Facebook groups? Are they free? Can anybody go and join? Yeah, yeah. It's just uh, you know, it's got the cover of the yellow book, the Sugar Detox and Sugar Addiction Support Group. It's got about 12,000 people in it, 11 something. And then there's one about the food because we separate out the food. You don't want them talking about the food in that group. So and there's another one. It's the same. It's, there's links into there too. Great. But yeah. We'll put if you up. just get the book, like go to the website, either either website, get a copy of the book. We, we brought it home. It is free on Amazon. But you, if you want to get it on Amazon by a hard copy, you can. Yeah. But we give it away free at the websites. And then inside, you'll get links to all the, 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 the groups and stuff. Great. So we'll put your website, sugaraddiction.com, sugardetox.com. Yeah. Anywhere else on social media, you want them to go check you out, Instagram? Or I'm Sugar Free Man on social media, Twitter, Instagram. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, on most of the platforms, I'm Sugar Free Man. Or, you know, sugaraddiction.com on Facebook's pretty big. But, um, you know, again, genuinely, Ben, Google and Facebook do not like the term. And so the growth of the sugar addiction page has been stunted. And even the, I think my group, I think the group should be five times as big as it is, but I think they're lightening on that. They're loosening on that a little bit, but yeah. So, so that's why I literally rebranded to sugar free man on social so that I could, you know, get out of the algorithm. Hell. <laughs> yeah. Smart. Smart. You got to work yeah. with uh, what's happening. So yeah. Mike, thank you so much for your expertise, your story of sharing about your mother and yourself with the struggles you had. And uh, your summit's going to be amazing. So I encourage everybody listening or watching to click the link and get signed up for free starting on January 24th, the Quit Sugar Summit. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate you. Um, and I look, I look forward to more uh, conversations with you. Keep up the good work, my friend. It's just uh, you're very generous with uh, exposing other people and other ideas. I really love that. So